morning. Good morning. Friends, welcome in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Welcome in the name of the God who is love, who has called us and gathered us together this morning. Welcome. Friends, brothers, and sisters, and if you will, prepare your hearts and your minds to worship the living God. Our call to worship today from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face to shine upon us, that Your way may be known on earth, Your saving power among all nations. Friends, let us worship God.
a living God, we are confident in the goodness of your eternal decrees, your perfect will, and your plans for us. And so we make all these prayers, our, our confessions, our praises, our petitions, we make all these prayers just as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, even us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Probably crowded and there would be little chance of a seat. 
so he expected to stand. But as he entered the subway car, an older man to his left jumped up and ran off the subway. So Marcel very gratefully sat down. Now Marcel had also been in New York long enough to know that you don't generally strike up a conversation with a stranger, unless of course you're me. But he did have the habit of looking at people's faces because he was a portrait photographer. So he looked at the young man now sitting to his left. And there he saw unbearable sorrow. He also saw that the young man was reading a newspaper that was printed in Hungarian. So uncharacteristically, Marcel said to the young man, I hope you don't mind if I glance at your paper. The young man looked up, startled to be addressed in his native language, but said, no, that's, that's fine. You may read it now, I'll have time later. So they started to talk. The young man's name was Bella Paskin. He came from a large town on the eastern edge of Hungary called Debrecen. Marcel knew Debrecen, so they talked about it for a little while. And then Bella told him the rest of the story. Bella had been a law student when World War II broke out. When the Germans overran Hungary, they took all the young men of Debrecen and took them to a war camp in the Ukraine, where Bella was put to work. When the Russians took the camp over, Bella was put to work burying the German war dead. When the war was over, Bella took to the road and crossed hundreds of miles to walk back to Debrecen. The first thing he did was to go to the apartment that his parents and his brothers and sisters had occupied. As a mother, I find that very touching, to tell his mother he was okay. But when he got there, there were strangers living there, and they could tell him nothing about his family. So he raced up the stairs to the apartment that he shared with his wife, and the same thing happened. There were strangers there, and they knew nothing of his wife and his family. Stunned, Bella went down and sat on the stoop outside on the street, his head in his hands, not knowing where to start to look. And suddenly he heard Bella Poskin, which means Uncle Bella. It was the um, son of some friends of his parents. The young man took Bella to his parents and there they told him the bad news. His entire family had been taken to Auschwitz and there they had all been killed. There was no hope. Stunned, heartbroken, Bella walked the streets of Debrecen for a few days and then realizing there was nothing left for him there, again took to the road and crossed border after border after border, a thousand miles to Paris where he was allowed to immigrate to the United States in October of 1947, just three months before he met Marcel. Now the whole time Bella was telling the story, Marcel couldn't help but think, this sounds really familiar. Just three weeks before, he'd been invited to the Christmas party of an important client of his. The party was on a December evening in Manhattan. Marcel doesn't like parties. He did want to get back on the train to go into Manhattan to a party, but this was an important client, and so he felt he should. While he was there, he met a young woman named Maria, who was also from Depression. She worked for his client. She too had been sent to Auschwitz and put to work in a German munitions factory, and while she was there, her entire family was killed. She was on the first boat of displaced persons after the Americans liberated the camp. So fumbling in his side in what he hoped was an unobtrusive manner, he hoped to casually ask Bella, was your wife's name Maria, by any chance? Bella looked at him, stunned, and just stammered. How did you know? Well, the train was approaching the station, and so Marcel took Bella by the arm and said, let's get off here. Took him to a phone booth. Remember phone booths? <laughs> and dialed Maria's number. Maria lived in a boarding house. Marcel had taken her contact information down while he was at the party because he was so moved by her story, he thought, the least I can do is bring her back to the house where my wife can cook her a, a good home-cooked Hungarian meal when the weather gets better. So he dialed Maria's number. Now Maria lived in this boarding house single room. There was a common room outside and the phone for all of the tenants was right outside of her door. But she developed the habit of never answering it because it was never for her. She really didn't have friends. But that day there was no one else home. So the phone rang and it rang and it rang. And finally Maria decided she should probably answer it and take a message. Marcel reminded her of who he was and how they met, and then said, Maria, I'm going to ask you a very strange question. Can you describe your husband for me? Surprised, she did. He said, Maria, when you lived in Debrecen with your husband, what was the address of the apartment that you occupied? And she told him. 
So Marcel covered the receiver. Remember having to cover a receiver? It doesn't work with an iPhone. He covered the receiver and turned to Bella and said, when you lived in Debrecen, what was this the address of the apartment that you and your wife occupied? Bella's face turned white and he said, yes. Marcel took the receiver and handed it to Bella and said, something miraculous is about to happen to you. Here, speak with your wife. Bella took the receiver and listened for a minute and then broke down into sobs. And all he could get out was, it is Bella, it is Bella. Well, realizing that Bella was becoming completely incoherent, Marcel took the receiver back and realizing that Mario was equally hysterical on the other side, said to her, I'm going to bring your husband to you. Stay where you are. We'll be right there. And hung up. He turned to Bella, who was shaking and sobbing, and all he could say was, he is my wife. I can go see my wife. Well, realizing that this was a moment into which no stranger should intrude, Marcel hailed a cab, put Bella in the back, gave the driver the address and the fare, and said goodbye. Now, the skeptics in the room are probably going, yeah, right, that's a true story, sure. Way too many coincidences that can't be true. But was it? Was it chance that Marcel went to a Christmas party and uncharacteristically wrote down the contact information of a young woman whose story moved him? Was it chance that he decided uncharacteristically on his way to work, on his usual train, to take a detour and go to Brooklyn? Was it chance that the old man jumped up and ran off the train just as Marcel entered? Was it coincidence that there was no one home when Marcel called Maria? Was it chance? Or was God riding the Brooklyn subway that afternoon? And when you hear a story like that, something that is so moving, so amazing, so touching, you sort of have to share it. So why is it? Why is it we have trouble telling the most amazing, the most moving, the most soul-touching story of all? Why do we have so much trouble telling the story of the gospel? You can be Moses and say, not me, Lord, I am slow of tongue and I stutter. You can be Jonah and say, not me, Lord, you're going to send me out there, they're going to laugh at me, and I'm going to look like a fool. We're embarrassed, we're hesitant, we don't think we can answer the tough questions, and so we just don't. The verse we read in Matthew, that chapter, ends with the Great Commission. The biggest challenge that Christ gave to his disciples at the end of his three years of earthly ministry. It is still our greatest challenge today to go and tell. This chapter of Matthew is short, it's only 20 verses, and yet three times in that short period of verse, we are told to go and tell. And when you're told something that many times in that short period of scripture, that's a message you need to pay attention to. It's a roller coaster chapter. It starts with the women in the garden. They've gone there to weep and to pray and to mourn for their dead Messiah. But what do they find? The stone has been rolled away, the tomb is empty, and there sits an angelic being. Can you imagine how terrified they were? How confused they were? Because even though Jesus had told all of his disciples what exactly was going to happen, they never really quite got it. In Matthew 28, verses 5-7, through 7, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come. See the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And I guess the angel was told to go and tell too. So maybe there are four goes and tells in that chapter. Do not be afraid. Go and tell. And immediately those obedient women go in the next set of verses, chapter, or verses 8 through 10. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus himself met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus himself said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Do not be afraid. Go and tell a scant eight verses later, the disciples had made the 90-mile journey from Jerusalem to the Galilee. And there they behold the risen Christ, who tells them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, 
therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, telling them, all I have commanded you. Do not be afraid, for all authority has been given to me. Go and tell. And Jesus' authority didn't end there because he gave it to his disciples. He sent out 11 and they changed the world. They were literally co-missioned to his purpose to go and make disciples and build the kingdom. That continues to be our mission today. And it's one we wrestle with. But to give people the power and the love and the mercy and the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. That continues to be what Jesus asks us to do. And it's not easy at first. As Presbyterians, I think we find it hard. It's personal, he said. I don't want to offend anyone. Maybe they'll see it in the way I live. Well, I hope no one's looking too closely at the way I live. I want to tell you a story about a church I know. This church gives out 300 meals every Wednesday. They have a big parking lot. The pastor challenged the people from his church to tell the people who were receiving the meals why this church gave the meals out. He said, I want you to tell them that we're giving you this meal because we love Jesus and we want you to know that Jesus loves you too. And the response from his congregants was, oh, I don't know if I can do that. I might offend someone. Really? So they decided to do it with stickies. They put a sticky on the top of every meal that said, we're giving you this meal because we love Jesus and we want you to know Jesus loves you too. And after a couple of months, they felt awkward just handing that. So they started to say it. And as they started to say it, conversations grew up. And Bible studies formed. And some of those people started going to church. Maybe not that church, but a church. Friendships developed. Deeper level of cares emerged. It's what we're asked to do. It's hard to make disciples when you're uncomfortable talking about it. And yet it's the way that is most defining for us, certainly most eternally defining. But there are some ways to gently open that door, plant that seed. Thank God the final act of conversion is not up to us. That's the Holy Spirit. So how can you execute your commission? First, you have to claim the power that Christ has given you. It's here for you right now. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. It's not waiting for you in heaven. You have it here. And once you claim that power, let me give you a couple of ideas. I worked for Procter & Gamble for 26 years. Big company. I had a big job. For the last 10 years I was there, I very deliberately and prayerfully ended every single of my hundreds of everyday emails with instead of kind regards or sincerely blessings. One of the women who worked for me, who was also a believer, said, are you really sure you want to do that? You could really get in trouble. But I did. I never once got castigated or called into an HR office. Bible studies began to spring up at lunchtime. People would come and say, can I talk to you? And we'd go into a huddle room privately. One VP told me, you have no idea how that makes me smile every time I see it. When you're doing your personal emails or a personal letter, put your favorite Bible verse under your name. Mine is Psalm 16.8. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. There's a longer reason, longer story as to why that's my verse, but we'll save that for another time. Instead of the, have a nice day, when you're in line at the bank or the post office or Kroger or McDonald's, say, be blessed. You will be shocked at how many times you get this gesture back. Thank you. Instead of when people ask you, how are you doing? Instead of saying, fine, which means actually feelings internalized, not expressed. <laughs> say, I'm blessed. I'm ridiculously blessed. For those of you who love to give books, give devotions. And then, of course, there's the St. Francis of Assisi method. Preach at all times and when necessary, use words. I said that to a confirmation class I was teaching a few years ago, and this absolutely beautiful 13-year-old girl said, whoa, mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Christian school here in town where the parents came up with an idea. The athletic department has a phrase, they say, win twice, win once on the field and once for God. So for every athletic event, no matter what it is, basketball, football, soccer, volleyball, the parents stay and clean up both sides of whatever venue they're on. Football stadium, 
home or away, basketball court, doesn't matter. Win twice. Win once for whatever you're doing and win once for God. Help the struggling mom with the toddler and the baby and the full cart of groceries. Hold the door open a little bit longer when you're entering into music hall or church and compliment people, talk to them. Spread the joy. In this time of crazy division that we live in, speak words of peace. When the gossip streams start, use that as an opportunity to tell how Christ has given you the ability to love people that you really don't like and ones that don't like you. When the hard times come, and they will, use that as an opportunity to talk about the hope that you've been given and that you live by. Only disciples can go and tell. And no matter how you start, I guarantee there's something in it for you because every act of blessing you give is also an act of praise and worship. And there's a promise in it for you too because the very last line of Matthew 28 is the promise that Christ gave to his disciples. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It took a while for the disciples to go to Galilee. It's a five-day walk that 90 miles. It will take a while for the people you speak with to come to Christ, and that's okay. When the disciples met with Jesus in the Galilee, some believed right away and some doubted. Some of the people you speak with will doubt too, and that's okay. Go and tell. Do not be afraid. For you too have been given authority. You too have been given Christ's power. Romans 10, verses 14 and 15 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? For it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. So my friends, go. And tell, do not be afraid, for Christ is with you. And there is no better promise than that. Now you want to hear the end of the story I started with? Marcel got back in touch with Bella and Mari after a couple of months, and they told him their reunion was so charged with emotion, so poignant, that really neither one of them could remember it. Mari said, I went to the mirror without thinking maybe my hair had turned white. And the next thing I know, there's a taxi pulling up outside, and it is my husband was getting out, whom I have not seen in six years. And I think maybe for the first time in so many years, we are happy. But I have never quite lost my ability to be afraid that every time he leaves the apartment, I might not see him again. Bella, however, had no such compunction. He knew exactly where this had come from. God, he said, providence has brought us back together. And so from that point, Bella became a pastor and opened a church for Hungarian refugees on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and for the rest of his life was out on the streets going about the business of clothing the cold and feeding the hungry and going and telling. So my friends, be encouraged. Do not be afraid. Christ is with you. Amen.
waste his waiting time, for this is the time the Lord has given us to do his mission. And said, I'll go with the strength of God, the love and grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Practice love without edges, forgiveness without borders, and justice without margins, for this is what the Lord requires of you. And now may the God of time go with you from this place in all of your moments, blessing you both now and forevermore. Amen.